Hello everybody and welcome to Independent uh, Film Productions live stream. And today we have a guest, uh, obviously, again, James is back. Hello, James. Hello. Hi, everybody. How are you? I'm very well. Yeah. Very well. Enjoying the sunshine. <laughs> yeah, and I, I do as well. And I'm, and I'm enjoying a full day of streams as well and <laughs> useful information uh, for filmmakers. So learning a lot. Uh, last time uh, when, when we were in kind of this situation, uh, I remember that uh, we were very ambitious. We were trying to do 100, 100 tips in, in, in less than an hour. And we ended up uh, sitting for like two hours and, and we got up to 50. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> so. was, we, we didn't treat it so much as a list, but as a discussion point, I think, um, was the error of our ways back in the, back in the <laughs> olden days when you were just a, a, a newbie. And um, so yeah. I, I, I guess we're going to we're going to still do some discuss discussing here, probably just go go through the list one by one. And this time, for sure, 100 percent, this list is going to go online uh, and it doesn't matter how far do we get because it's all about the quality of the content, isn't it? Uh, not the quantity. Absolutely. Content is king. So, uh, um, so maybe you can just uh, just uh, remind about yourself. Who are you? What do you do? Okay, uh, my name is James Newton. I'm a director and also sometime writer. Um, I've been a director for maybe 20 years now. Um, I came up through from having trained as an actor. I worked as an actor for about 10 years. I worked in TV soap, in film and in theater. And then I started directing theater. I spent a long time working in theater and then moved into short film. Uh, ran about the time that everybody was shifting from film to digital. Um, that seemed to be the, the time that I kind of started embracing film. Um, and uh, my first feature film, which is a kid's film called Two Hours, is being released uh, on the 30th of July. And today, in fact, there's a, there's a screening at the Odeon and Brighton of it. Um, mm. It's a kid's film. Um, it's great. It's a lovely little kind of uplifting um, film about a 15-year-old kid who finds out he might only have two hours left to live. And then he embarks on a bucket list across London, trying to cram a lifetime into two hours, chased by a mad female scientist and a couple of hapless journalists. It's a bit of a caper. It kind of harks back to the old style um, films that I used to watch when I was a kid. And I, I really think that we're missing that kind of film for our children. So I set about trying to make that with uh, the writer Roland Moore. So anyway, it's out there, it's out in the world now. And um, I've just started development and prep um, on uh, my next feature film, which is called A God Amongst Men, which is about Muhammad Ali. Um, so it's, oh, 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 whoa, 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 easy, easy. We, I, I can ask some questions about that as well. But actually, just to show how dedicated uh, James is, screening of his film is basically happening right now. So, guys, he's here with us and uh, and uh, sharing his kind of experiences with us, which is amazing. Thank you for that. Uh, but uh, w about your next project, so it, it sounds huge. So, just a little bit to g give us a taste of it, basically. Well, in 1977, I was uh, I was eight years old and uh, living in a small coal mining village in the northeast of England, which is where I grew up. If you've seen Billy Elliot, well, that's where I grew up. I, I went to school with Lee Hall. Um, so he wrote Billy Elliot about our area. Um, so in July 1977, I met Muhammad Ali in Tyneside. And this was an amazing experience for me. He was the first black man I ever met. Um, and he was getting his wedding blessed in a local mosque in South Shields. Um, and that was just an extraordinary event that Muhammad Ali should be in that part of the world for five days. And the story is, is based on, uh, it's based on me meeting Muhammad Ali effectively um, um, and how that came to be. Uh, it's a fascinating tale. Um, a great story, and we hope to maybe start shooting it end of next year. Okay, that's that 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 sounds exciting, actually. So, all right, uh, guys, if online, uh, just just let us know what's going on with the sound. 
Is it all right? Can you hear us well or not? Because we are having some tiny issues today. So, so uh, hopefully you can hear us. Uh, okay, I have a list in front of me. Uh, just as a reminder, why, why, why did you make this list? What, what's on this list? What is it? This was, after when I was shooting two hours, I was obviously up in London, and every night I'd go back and I'd write a list of the things that I learned that day. Because no matter what people say, um, shooting your first feature film, you can shoot as many short films as you like. Nothing will prepare you for shooting a feature film. It's a marathon. It's a collaborative marathon. Often when you're shooting a short film, there's a singular, almost an auteur-like approach to it from a director's point of view. Um, this is the kind of vision that you, you try and hold on to while you make a short film. It's supposed to reflect your own, um, your own kind of authenticity and put your own stamp on things. This is your own vision. A feature film is not like that. Certainly not your first feature film. It is a collaborative effect. Um, you're bringing together lots and lots of different creative talents and you're marshalling them into a space where you think that's the best way of telling the story that you have. In between that, you throw in budget, you throw in time, and you throw in all the problems of locations, the problems and challenges that you're going to come up with actors, with casting, uh, with the weather, and with the kit that you've got available. So all of those things get thrown into the mix. So every night I would go back and I'd make a list of the things that I thought I'd learned that day. Mm -hmm. um, and that culminated with me having these 100 tips um, that I thought would be useful for other first time film directors uh, for for a feature film. You can throw these out the window for a short film. Some of them you may kind of uh, get something for. But if you're directing your first feature film, there's no harm in just flicking through these and just reminding yourself that these are possibles. These are possible outcomes. These are possible things that you should be taking into consideration. Definitely. That's, definitely. And I, I'll be reading it before I shoot my second one, that's for sure. <laughs> okay, so, uh, or, or just watch our live stream. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Go back through that. So, yeah, guys, you can go on our website and uh, the first part of this stream, which was. Uh, that w which was filmed kind of quite a while ago uh, you can watch it on our website okay uh, I'm looking at the list and what I see here now is uh, you said that in the edit if you have to choose between two takes always pick the one that sounds the best why that's right because um, we forgive images not being perfect but actually we can't forgive sound not being good and I've experienced this as an audience member and also as a filmmaker uh, many times. When the sound isn't right, it completely and utterly takes you out of the moment and out of what you're watching. Um, so through my experience, I've found that if you're, if you're kind of weighing up the pros and cons of two different approaches or two different takes that are quite similar, you choose the one that has the best sound. It keeps you in the moment and people forgive the image. They will forgive it a lot a lot easier than they forgive sound hmm. it's a i think it's a it's, it's a really useful thing to keep in the back of your mind yeah it, it, it does make sense and i'm gonna i'm gonna reply to the comment in the chat box yes you will have a list and and list is going to be downloadable as well as you can watch previous stream and obviously recording of this stream is going to be on our website as well independentfilmproductions.co.uk so uh, enough of that uh so the next one, when shooting material for a montage or cutaways, to add breathing space to your story, try using music on set for pacing. How did you come up with this kind of idea and why? Well, uh, I, I was fortunate that when we were shooting, we had a little bit of a gap between two parts of the shoot. Um, so we had actually quite a few months because it was a we were raising finance as we were going effectively. We had a main block of shooting for about 29 days and then we came back and shot another eight days. Um, and those eight days were not pickups. They were a continuation of what we would have shot um, from the beginning had we had all the funds to do that. But, you know, it's a first time feature. Um, these are the obstacles you've got to overcome. Um, and I shot two montages uh, during each each shoot and I found that when we edited the montage from the first uh, batch of filming that we did um, the pacing and the change and the the things in, that were happening on screen didn't necessarily fit the style 
of music that we thought we wanted to use. So we ended up using something quite different, which works. It works really well. But when I was planning this and when I had the, this idea of this little montage just to pass some time to get us from one space to another space, I envisaged something else completely. And we shot that in, in the way that I thought it would exist in my head. Second time round, we needed a slightly different montage for some different characters. It was almost the same space. We had to move the characters from one location to another without showing every kind of single step of the way, but kind of learn something about these characters while doing it. Um, and that time, I had a piece of music. I had it in my head. I, I had it through my own cans. You don't need to broadcast it to everybody, but if you're watching the monitor and you're directing the actors and directing the camera, um, and any movement, if you've got that pacing and that beat and that kind of rhythm of the kind of music you want to be using in that montage, you can cut and call action and direct accordingly. And that made it a much easier process when we got so, into the So end. basically what you're saying is uh, to listen to the music just just, just by yourself or, or, if, or if, playing if we, it to yeah, everybody? Well, or? If we could have afforded to have speakers and to play it to everybody, you know, on set, then I would have done that. But we didn't we couldn't do that. The the only way is I was able to describe it to the actors. They were able to listen to it. So they got a kind of a rhythm for it. So when they were running, they were running in the beat of the music that we we're going to be using or they, they kind of, you know, they, they knew it's... what we were going to be cutting it to. Um, and I had it in my ear. And that was the cheapest of uh, way you know... of. Uh, 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 usually, we ha you have playback on the, on the set of a music video, you know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah not, not 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 so much for um, for uh, for like sequences like like you were describing, which is, it's it's quite interesting approach actually. And and in the chat box as well, we see that somebody says, "Wow, this is innovative approach." So it's it, it's good. It's good. Yeah, it's different. It's different, and I can see how it can help actually. Yeah. It, it can help, even if even if that specific piece of music is not the one you're using, but you're going to use something with maybe a very close BPM to it. You know, the the, the beat of it is going to be very similar. Um, and you can always do you can you can have two tracks, and you can you know during shooting it twice, you can direct things in a slower way, so you've got option when you go into the edit. But I think generally with montages, you kind of know the pacing of it. So if you've got that in your ear as you're watching it, as you're directing it. You know, there's a very small thing you can do that it's 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 a win win for me. All right, okay, yeah. So let's move on. And the next one, the secret to avoiding having a saggy middle in your story is the eight sequence approach. Yeah, tell us about that. So, um, probably don't have I, I do have it. Don't tell anyone, yeah. But this is my Bible. Okay, uh, hold it up a bit higher, please. We want, yeah. Okay. So, grab yourself a copy of that. It's on Amazon or somewhere online. Um, a sequence is approximately ten pages, and there's a specific thing that will happen in that sequence. So you're still dealing in acts. You're still dealing in Act One. Act two, act three. But act one will be made up of two sequences. Act two will be made up of four sequences. And act three will be made up of two sequences. And because there are specific things that need to happen within those sequences, when you come to act two, there's a driving force that gets you through because you have to hit specific kinds of beats uh, that are particular for your story. And once you learn about the sequence approach, you'll understand how it doesn't just fit any story, but it fits every single story. Um, and it's a way of being able to push your way through that second act without having that little dip that often happens in stories uh, where people kind of run out a little bit of steam. Um, I was recently kind of pleased to learn that Ron Howard, Steven Spielberg, people like that who uh, start storyboarding their scripts they storyboard from an eight sequence approach. Mm. So everything is based around that. So they reference that kind of approach. I think you can get involved at script stage. So when you've got your script, you can make sure that it fulfills the criteria of each one of those sequences. And again, it's, it's cross genre. Every single genre will fit an eight sequence approach. Get yourself a book, absorb it, learn it, forget it, and then use it. Okay, that's, that's useful as well. 
so you're saying here that there are a bunch of apps that can help with pre-production. Yeah, so what I did, um, I got myself a, a really old little iPad mini. And on that iPad mini, I had a bunch of apps. I had the script, I had my storyboards, I had my bits of music, I had any kind of reference, look, book, that kind of thing. I think this might actually be one of the later tips. Uh, but on there, I also had uh, a bunch of apps. Now, some of these are probably outdated now. Um, there may be newer ones, but I still kind of come back to these ones. Helios, Artemis, Shotlister, Shot Designer, Sunseeker, and AccuWeather. Um, they all help you when you're doing your location recce. So they'll tell you where the sun is going to be at a particular time of day. If you're looking at being in a street, maybe there's a tower block there, but you're there at 12 o'clock recceing it. You know you're going to be shooting at 6 o'clock. Where's the sun going to be? You can stand there and kind of stick your finger in the air and work it out, or you can just open up an app and it'll tell you it'll tell you exactly. So you can work out which part of the street you might need to close off, or where you might uh, end up shooting something, um, you know, in shadow, or if you want light, they're just invaluable. Um, um, did you did you consider kind of getting an, an iPad uh, uh, just because of your uh, applications, useful applications, or or actually you were thinking about green production as well? Well, I I, I thought it would be useful rather than have file after file of you know storyboards, my script, my notes, my shooting schedule. If if I had all of that in one place and it, it was, you know, it, as an iPad mini, it's something that's really small. You can just pass it off to either a script supervisor or somebody and say, you know, can you just hold on to that while I go and deal with the actors? Or you can take it with you and show them something from, from there as you're explaining to and, them. And, and, and that's your next point, basically. Get yourself an iPad that you can yeah. dedicate to the project. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, and I've now upgraded. I've got an iPad Pro, and on there you can use the stylus to hand draw storyboards. It's it's just brilliant. It's a it's right from development through production to a post production tool. Now, um, you know, grab one if you can. Mm. Okay, if you want to be spontaneous on set, then over prepare. Yeah, yeah. So um, often particularly at the end of the day you'll find yourself you'll get to your location you'll say okay we've got this thing to shoot we had two and a half hours in the schedule to do this but because we've been delayed there's been traffic the weather um, or someone hasn't arrived on time or for whatever reason you've now only got 30 minutes to shoot this scene now if you've got an idea in your head if you've storyboarded it if you've planned it if you've even rehearsed it vaguely with the actors you can then throw all of that out the window and try something new. And it's very easy to do that. And it's actually quite liberating sometimes. Um, in two hours, for instance, we got to a place in the street and um, we, were, we were really late. And actually, it was a road which we weren't allowed to close off, but we were allowed to shoot on. Um, and we decided to do a 360 um, with a steady cam, and we shot the entire scene in one go. Um, the scene lasts two minutes, 20 seconds, and it's all shot on steady cam. So you're just showing uh, off, yeah? Well, it, it, it came out of necessity. It came out of necessity. Now, I'd storyboarded something a little more complex that would have taken a little bit more time. Um, and because of my understanding of the scene, the two characters, they are the two journalists, are a bit silly, they're a bit stupid. They're chasing our main character. They can't find them. They're basically going round in circles, and they're on a moped. So they drive up, they get off the moped. One of them gets off the moped, and he walks around the other one, and we walk around with him with the steady cam. They go. They are figuratively going round in circles. So uh, from a camera language point of view, it fit perfectly. But we were only able to do that and take that risk because we'd already planned what we really, really wanted to do, but didn't have the time to do, we took the essence of that and did it a different way. Mm. And actually, it's much, much better. It's much, much better. And I think about all the time I spent prepping and developing that storyboard for that particular scene, and it wasn't wasted, even though we didn't use a single board of that. It wasn't wasted at all, because it, it gave me this idea of w what I needed the scene to do um, and what we needed to get out of it and what the end result had to be. We just ended up 
shooting it completely differently. And that was only because we did all that preparation. Okay. So the next one is, uh, as much as possible, watch the actors from the side of the camera. What do you mean by that? Well, rather than being Video Village, um, if you're lucky enough to have Video Village, so Video Village is where you've got your script supervisor, costume, and other people who are... Um, who, whose job it is to be watching what's going down on screen. A lot of directors will go there and they will sit in Video Village and watch what's happening on screen. Um, you are then detached from the actors. The actors are your responsibility on set. You need to get as close to them as possible. You can always watch that back afterwards. You check the framing anyway, so you're standing next to the camera. You know what the framing is going to be. You watch and you 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 communicate with the actors from the side of the camera. You get a much better response from actors uh, if you do that because they feel as if you're part of what they're doing and what they're getting involved in. So what are, what, what, what are you going to say to directors who usually, uh, 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 who usually say that um, it's not a theater, so you should be actually looking at the frame, looking at the screen, because that's what the viewer is going to see? Yeah. Well, you are not the viewer. You are a conduit to get the performance from the actors and get it onto the screen. Sitting behind the screen and watching something from afar distances you from the actors. Now, if you're working with the very best actors that are out there, you know, you've got an A-list cast, then you might be able to afford to do that and just step back and say, okay, you go do your thing and I'm going to sit and watch it as the audience will inevitably watch it. If you want to be more involved in that performance and to help gauge the nuance and to bring that nuance out, you will see things from standing by the side of the camera that you wouldn't notice and you wouldn't pick up on if you're in Video Village. This will give you an opportunity to maybe reframe something, just move something very slightly, or give a little bit of direction to the actors, which will completely change the performance. You can only do that if you're that if you're in that vicinity and, and, and really close to them. All right. So the next one, wait as long as you dare before you cut on set. We've used quite a few moments in our, uh, in our film, in our final edit. There are quite a few moments there that only exist after they've stopped playing the scene. It can be a look. It can be them leaving frame. It can be them just doing something. There's just precious little moments. So when the scene's going and it's played out and they've finished their little, um, you know, their, their, their dialogue or their action, whatever it was they were doing, just wait. Just wait a beat before calling cut. And you might find that you get just a moment. It might be a look. It might be a a relaxing of the shoulders from the actor. It can be anything, but just give it a little bit of space. Don't be so quick to call cut. Mm. Yeah, that's that's quite useful because I've heard these stories over and over again when actually a lot of reaction shots which are used in the films are, are actually yeah something what they didn't really expect to get at all. So Yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, learn to pitch your story. That's a big one. Yeah, yeah. It, it sounds so simple, but actually... Pitching your story starts when, you, when you're when you talking to your investors, uh, when you're talking to people who you want money for to either develop the story or to put the story into production. Um, you've got to have that story nailed down. You've got to know what your 30-second pitch is, what your one-line pitch is, what your five-minute pitch is, and what your dinner party conversation pitch is. Um, and it's worth rehearsing them. It's worth writing them out rehearsing them and knowing them off pat so when you find yourself in those situations you know exactly which pitch to give them and you know you're not going to be floundering you're not going to be trying to make up things on the hoof but you've got a, a well-worn route to communicating your story in the space and the time that you find yourself in color color is important that's number 60 on your list it's so easy when you're shooting outside to just accept what's there but actually introducing something uh it might be a poster it might be a piece of rubbish it could be a bin it could be a chair it could be absolutely anything but really give it some thought as to uh as to the coloring of that and i i think 
if you if anybody is a fan of Breaking Bad, everybody will remember that pink teddy. And that was so important throughout the whole story. Um, and yet visually, it was very striking because it was pretty much the only pink thing uh, within the whole story. And it's just about giving that attention to detail and not necessarily accepting everything that a location gives to you. You know, it can't be changed. It can. And you can introduce a little bit of color to help support or say something about um, where your characters are and the mind space that they're currently in. Even experienced actors want directing or direction. Yeah, it's true. Um, and, you know, I've made this mistake before because um, I used to be an actor. Um, so, you know, I've been on set before. I've been directed by directors. Um, and I've seen it from both sides that some directors will just leave you alone and let you get on with it. Um, and I think it's always worth having that conversation before you roll over, before um, you share action as to what it is that you're looking to capture from that moment and what you think the character is going through, the kind of space they're in and where they're going to end up by the time that you shout cut. It's always good to communicate that. Don't ever assume that because you have an actor who's got 200 credits and this is your first feature film that they're going to you know, they're going to know what to do. Um, they don't. They don't know what's inside your head. And they'll be very grateful for you talking to them. Um, I don't think there are ver there are many actors at all out there who would actually uh, turn their nose up at talking to uh, the director before actions called. I mean, it's it's just it's a benefit for everybody. Hmm. The next one is quite painful. So the first assembly will make you feel ill and you'll question your life choices. If if it wasn't for the fact that I'd listened to so many director commentaries on Blu-rays and everybody had kind of mentioned, oh, the first assembly, it was it was three hours long or, you know, it was four hours and it was awful and it was hideous. Um, and I, I would never have believed it. So I was kind of a little bit prepared. But then when I saw my first assembly, I was like, I'm finished. What have I done? I've completely wasted my life. I've got to this point thinking I can do this. And it's awful. It's dreadful. How can I have got away with thinking that I can produce something? And it's so awful and bad and terrible. And then you go away and you think about it and you, you kind of need a little bit of time. You need, I, I had two so weeks. How, how did you get through this? I had two weeks away from it which was very lucky. I don't think, you know, that's perhaps a normal experience, but I had two weeks from seeing the first assembly to then going back with notes. And this was just because of editor availability. So we, we were lucky in that respect. And in those two weeks, I was able to grow distant from it because I didn't, I really didn't want to watch it again. I, the, I, was, I was horrified. It was like, no, how can it be so bad? And then after two weeks, and I knew I had to go back to the editor and give some notes, I looked at it again. And you start to then see things differently. And you see things that are really good. And, oh, that's a nice moment. And we can shape that. And um, yeah, actually, shape. Like, yeah, yeah, about the, shape. The that's the next one you have. The first assembly. Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, to direct is to guide and shape. Yes. Yeah. Not dictate. Don't be a dictator. Um, a few people see, say this, uh, and I, I'm really from this school of thought, and I recognize that not everybody is, but a director is a glorified traffic warden. Basically, you're, you're guiding um, creativity into the best possible space. You are cherry picking the best from everybody. Otherwise, you'd be doing it yourself. You'd be holding the camera. You'd be holding the boom. You'd be lighting it. You'd be acting in it. You'd write the script. That's not really a movie, um, or it's probably not a movie that I really want to see. Um, what what a director's job is to do is to have the idea of the story and then to cherry pick the best from everybody that helps tell that story. Now, anybody can have that great idea. It can be a runner. It can be the costume. It can be makeup. It can be lighting. It can be a grip suggesting a different way to do things. You've just got to open yourself up to everybody as part of this process. It is a collaborative process. And your job as director is to cherry pick the best of everybody to get the very best product. Uh, do you do you actually believe that any actor is sort of directable or, or not? 
if they're a trained actor, yes, they are. Um, people who, you know, you, you oftentimes you can pick someone off the street and they'll be good for for something. You know, they, they might um, be the perfect look uh, that you're looking for for a particular character, um, but they can't work on camera. They just, they don't, they have a stiffness or something about them and you can't get under the skin. You can't get that performance from them. Um, so that happens with the, with actors who, not necessarily who aren't talented, but who have not been trained. Because mm. during the training process, it's, you know, whichever school you go to, it's a long process. You get exposed to different styles of directing and different ways of doing things. You you kind of become open to to being manipulated and moved around a bit. Um, so it, you know it's easy it's, it's easier to direct a trained actor, and any trained actor can be directed. Uh, so number sixty four, what do you mean by saying pay attention to scene transitions? Well, I think um, scene transitions have. I've always been interesting, you know, um, Hitchcock uh, was very keen on scene transitions. So, so kind of uh, blending from one scene to a, to another scene, Edgar Wright has taken it to a, a different extreme. And there's some, um, there's some YouTube videos out there where they've, they've done kind of super cuts of all Edgar's transitions, which are, you know, some of them are fantastic. Um, and in the UK, we've got uh, the Sherlock, um, series with Benedict Cumberbatch, um, the, they play heavily on scene transitions. And uh, if anyone saw The Darkest Hour with um, uh, with uh, Gary Oldman at, uh, earlier in the year, they also uh, use scene transitions in in kind of key ways. And I think when you're planning, when you're storyboarding, it's always worth thinking about how you're going to move from this location with these people into a different location, which might be a different timing, it might have a different feel to it. And is there a way of doing something really visual and very interesting with that? Can you can you use the language of visual storytelling to get you from point A mm. to point F? Can you do that? And if you can, then explore that, but they need planning. 65, work closely with your director of photography to establish your language and rules? Yes, so um, as I was talking about our two hapless journalists earlier, um, the one that we did the 360 with, they were joined at the hip. So um, while we were doing storyboards, my DP and I, Sarah Dean, um, who was a great DP for us, um, we spent a lot of time thinking about what the visual language of our story would be because I didn't want to just do cut, 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 and shot. I wanted to move the camera. I wanted to to kind of evoke those kind of early Amblin type films that we used to watch on Saturday mornings. Um, you know, it was it was the Goonies, so we did a lot of tracking shots and a lot of movement shots, and they give some restrictions and some freedoms as well. Um, now, with our two journalists, we decided that because they were joined at the hip, that we would always have them in a two shot. So every time we see them, they're in a two shot. They're always together. It's Laurel and Hardy, if you like. It's the Thompson twins. We, we, I, I, I'm not sure we ever see them just one at a time. There's no single shots of them. It's two shots. Uh, it's a two shot with both of them in frame at the same time. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that's that's a useful thing to to kind of think about when you're uh, when you're developing your boards. Okay, uh, think about how your characters move across the screen. Mm. So we had a lot of chase sequences. So we had a lot of times our characters were just coming towards us, going off or going past screen. Um, and if you've got everyone moving from left to right, then it gets a little bit dull and a little bit boring. Um, so we decided to examine the story and say, well, okay, so we know that this guy has got to get from here to the school and he's got to do it in the quickest possible time, but he doesn't always go the right way. Um, sometimes he gets lost. Sometimes there are obstacles in the place. So we, we carefully looked at his journey and his traveling across screen so every time 
that we thought he wasn't going the most direct route or he was being sidetracked, we had him going the opposite way across screen. Um, and then we had our journalists always going the same way across screen as they were getting closer and closer to him. And it kind of helped build a dynamic in there. So it's an interesting idea um, to, to look at. How are your characters moving across screen? Are they you know, following Occam's razor, the, 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 the most obvious and simple way to get to where they want to be? Or are they encountering obstacles? And if they are, is there a way of moving them in a different way a uh, different direction across screen. So basically, you've learned to move the camera as well as movement of your characters, basically. Yeah, very specific yeah. movement of your characters. Okay, and uh, number 67. First impressions count. How we see the character on the screen for the first time is crucial. Yeah, so th this wasn't something that I kind of learned until a little bit too late into the shoot. That every time we saw... A new character for the first time um, you 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 kind of come to so many conclusions about that person now you can as a director as a storyteller you can decide to fulfill some of those um, thoughts that the audience might have about this person or you can try and turn them on their head or you can try and deliberately mislead them um, and it's worth thinking about the first time you see your bad guy what are they doing are they doing something bad? Are they doing something good? Make a decision um, that's useful to your story. Um, but don't just accept that, oh, here's this person. We're going to show them on screen and not inflect anything in there. Is, there is, is, is your main character the first one you see in your film? Because this is what people are talking about all the time, saying, oh, you should show your main character first. You know, that's how it should be. But So what happened in your movie? Well, in our movie, we've got a helicopter shot across London, um, across the Thames, and then we discover our main character on a rooftop graffitiing on the top of a car park. So effectively, yes, he's the first person we see. Um, so I do think that's important. Um, it's not necessarily the be-all, end-all. There are thousands of very successful movies out there who don't reveal their main character for several minutes into the film, and they all seem to work. Um, you know, rules are there to be broken. Hmm. Yeah, I guess, I guess. 68. Know the highs and lows of your story and make sure you capture those moments with the right attitude. Hmm. So this is about tone. This is about tone and how you, how you capture um, those peaks and troughs within your story. So as I was talking earlier with uh, with a sequence approach, you've got, you've got your eight sequences and within each sequence something something major will happen to change the course of your story. Uh, now, that can be an uplifting moment or it can be a downward inflection moment. And it's worth identifying that that either crisis or ha aha moment, whatever it is, and work out exactly how you're going to shoot that um, and make sure that you're giving it the credit and the time that it needs to land on your audience. Um, so it's not something that's lost um, in a big wide shot. If you've got a moment where your character's feeling ecstatic, they've just achieved something um, and they're moving in a different direction because of something they've learned, that will be lost in a great big wide shot. I'm not saying that you need to come in and be you know, um, uh, on a, on a close up with it, but it, you need to give it careful consideration. How are you going to portray that moment? What is the space, uh, around that character as they discover that moment? So for people who just joined, we are talking to James uh, and we're going through his, uh, 100, uh, uh tips, uh, for directors. So, uh, we are on number 69 right now. And uh, and the first part of the stream is on our website as well, so you can check it out. Uh, so sixty nine, you better. Oh, that's a good one as well. I like this one because yeah, I want to ask you why. Uh, so you better have a good reason for not shooting twenty four frames per second. Do you know? I'll, I'll, before you say anything, a lot of videographers are shooting now fifty frames a second constantly, constantly. Uh, me personally don't like it but uh but they do so tell me tell me about this well i i think the inverse of the question as you've just hinted at is the most important part of it 
why are you shooting something other than 24 frames per second? Mm. What, what are the justifiable reasons for you doing that? And unless you've got one, unless you've got a particular stylized or a, you're doing something in slow motion or you're trying to speed something up, unless you've got something specific about that moment that you need to shoot something other than 24 frames per second, why are you doing it? There's no, there's, there is no need in today's technology to shoot anything other than 24 frames per second unless you're trying to create something specific. Okay, yeah, yeah, I, I, I like that. <laughs> so, number 70, use the opportunity of having to cover up brands and labels. Uh-huh, okay, yeah. So, um, one of our opening scenes, we're in the kitchen. It's a family kitchen. Um, we've got Tim and his sister having breakfast before they go to school. Um, you know, they, they lift up the Rice Krispies and they shake out the Rice Krispies and pour them into the bowl. We can't use a box of Rice Krispies unless we want to go through the hassle of getting clearance to use them. Um, it's just not worth it. It's much easier for the art department to create something that labels, relabels and covers up that box. Now that's an opportunity to reinforce the themes of your film, of your story, or add something to it. So we we had ours um, redone as a kind of dinosaur themed um, serial. So it looked perfectly normal, it looked perfectly you know, reasonable that you could go and buy this in a shop. Now the dinosaur theme for us is, is, a, is a kind of critical point. Um, it, it, it's um, talking about extinction, which when Tim is on a school trip at the Natural History Museum, they, they run off from Dippy, from seeing the, the big Diplodocus in the Great Hall, and they find themselves um, in corridor after corridor, and then they, they, they kind of come out and they find themselves in a press conference where this female scientist is unveiling her latest invention, which is a machine called the Vitalitron, which can predict the time of death of any living creature. So we've got the, the machine, which is predicting death. We've got Dippy, which is extinction. And then we've got this box of cereal, which is hinting at and foreshadowing something that Tim's going to encounter later on. That's that's oh. that's another great idea, actually. Yeah, that's that's another level, you know. That's yeah. Good. So use those moments and those opportunities. And I have to say, we had a fab fabulous art department who created these boxes, and they did look like cereal boxes that you just go and buy, you know, um, off the shelf in a supermarket. Um, but you can't get these brands cleared for your for your feature film if you're on a kind of a limited budget. It's not worth your time. Use that opportunity in, in a wiser way mm. okay 71 a small budget and only a handful of extras for your crowd scenes can be saved by good sound design yeah so one of the one of my issues i had with my assembly edit we we had an opening sequence which takes place in a schoolyard um as the bell goes, everybody's getting dropped off and everybody's kind of moving into the school. And our characters are planning what they're going to do that day. They're going to bunk off from their school trip. Um, so we didn't have hundreds of extras. We had a few that were kind of moving around. And in the assembly edit, these, this was one of the scenes that I just pulled my hair out. I just said, oh, God, this, this looks awful. It looks dreadful. It doesn't look like there's anybody there. It's just our main cast. You can tell we shot this on a Saturday in the school car park and there was no one else there. This is awful. And then came our sound designer, uh, Matt Bonham, who put in the school bell. He put in the crowd of kids. He put in the cars pulling away. And suddenly it lifted the whole thing. And you get this idea that there's hundreds of kids moving in towards the school. We only had a few extras, so we saw them. Um, and with that sound design, it was like, OK, this this has actually sold me now. I, I completely believe this is the beginning of school um, on a busy morning and everybody's getting ready to go in. Um, and it was sound design that saved that. OK, yeah, we, we, you don't have to kind of don't underestimate good sound designer. That's what it is, isn't it? Uh, 72. Ensure your actors are contracted for ADR. You're going to need them. You're going to need them to come back and redo a word, redo a line um, because of an aircraft, because of car sounds, just 
because just make sure that it's in the contract that they're they're um, they're going to be doing it. It's it's a very simple, straightforward thing. We had it in our actors' contracts. I hate to think what it would have been like had we not had that, and we'd have to jostle and maybe repay them to come back and do that. So just a bit of forward planning. Hmm. Uh, what do you say about films which are like ninety percent ADR? Oh, to have had the budget to do that. Um, it's tricky, you know, it's tricky and it depends on the experience of your actor. Um, I, I certainly saw it. We had a bunch of, you know, younger actors, some who'd been trained, uh, some had been drama school, some who hadn't. And then we had some older actors who, you know, been in the game a long time um, and getting people to lip sync to their own lines that they may have said four or five months ago um, is tricky. It's tricky. And, you know, um, experienced guys can do it really easily and really quickly uh, most of the time. But even they, you know, come a cropper sometimes. Uh, so so from, um, uh, from, from sound and from ADR, uh, we're moving on to VFX. A freelance VFX artist who lives locally uh, is worth knowing. Absolutely. So I was lucky. So I found a guy who lives local to me um, and he was able to do all of the VFX for our film. We had 147 shots um, with with VFX in them um, and it cost an absolute fraction of what we would have had to pay um, a post house or, um, you know, uh, a VFX company to do this. The idea that I found a, a VFX artist who, you know, he's working on great big films, um, traveling up to London every day and, you know, working freelance for them. He was very happy to take a project that was closer to home. That meant he didn't have to commute. Um, and it was a project he was interested in. And that saved our bacon, you know, across our budget. That really saved our bacon. You know, I'd, I'd love to be able to tell you figures and stuff, but it was, it was a minuscule amount that we ended up paying and i you know i got quotes for the vfx and some of them were as much as 80 grand and you know in the scheme of our budget that's you know this is a this is this is quite interesting as well because uh uh people are trying to outsource uh, uh because it's it's cheaper but in this case it's completely the opposite you know you just you you probably yeah you should look around first probably and try to find kind of somebody suitable who lives next door yeah and absolutely then... and if you've got that relationship with somebody who's close by um i was able to talk to russell about things that i was going to shoot and he was saying if you can get it like this it's going to make my job a lot easier you know if you can just get a tight frame where it's just the hand it's just the matchbox that's all you need a blue background with a tablecloth mm -hmm. You know, and he was able to guide me and help me um, plan the, the, the kind of shots that would be the most cost effective for him to work on. Um, OK, yeah. uh, the next one. The ideas for your color grade are made by decisions in your lookbook or mood board. Yeah. So I think um, what I'm trying to what I was trying to get to here is that the, the planning that you do in pre-production um, when you sit down with your DP and you say, OK, these are the kind of films I want to reference. Um, you know, these are the kind of moments that are similar. Um, these are the kind of styles. This is my kind of art um, design outlook on it. Um, from there, you're going to start to pick up colors. Um, and knowing what those colors are, you can then take that. And when you're doing your lighting on set, that gets influenced uh, in the same way. So for us, brown and orange, because we wanted to hark back to that kind of um, 70s, 80s feel to something. So we were referencing the Goonies a lot and that kind of color palette. Um, and then that followed through. And when, when it came to making those decisions in color grade, it was very easy for us because we'd been lighting things in particular colors um, and we'd been shooting in locations that reflected those kind of colors. Um, and those those decisions had been made right back in pre-production when when Sarah and I sat down and started, um, you know, planning our shot lists and, and doing our storyboards. So number 75, somehow you are comparing uh, uh, filmmaking to to an onion. So so what is it? 
It strikes me that, you know, you you have this onion and it's got lots of layers and you you, you start to peel it back and you get to the core of it. And by the time you get there, you're, you're crying. Um, at the core of, of every great film is a really, really good script. And then you start to wrap other things around it. And the filmmaking process is just like an onion. And everything is a layer from from script to your pre-production to your shooting um, to then edit and post-production and grading and then um, releasing it and distribution. And all of these are just layers. And if you start to look at it in that way, then each layer becomes an achievable um, kind of action that you can take and you can quantify it. Um, and I think it's about looking at the layers that you can afford, um, the layers that you, you maybe can't afford but would like to have, you know, uh, uh, and is there is there the possibility of merging some of those layers according to your budget? Um, but if you understand that process of of filmmaking right from you know um, the, the the kind of conception idea through to delivery, then that makes the process a lot easier. Mm. So now we're going all the way back to casting. So when casting, use callbacks to test the chemistry of actors. Yeah. So. Um, we had 500 um, applicants for our main roles. So there were three main characters, and we had 500 applicants. Um, and we saw probably a third of those people. Um, so most people did a, a self-tape and sent that in. Um, so once we'd, once we'd narrowed down our kind of hot list of maybe five or six people for each role, we then started calling them back and pairing them up and giving them a scene. And sometimes I wrote a scene that wasn't in the film, but it, it, would, it would give them the opportunity of interacting with them in a particular way um, so you could see how they respond to direction. And um, I found it very useful that sometimes there were people who were really my favorite they, that I thought, this part for you, you've got it it's it's nailed on and then you pair them with the other actor that you think and this is going to be you know who you're going to be acting opposite and you put them together and there's no chemistry whatsoever it's just dead it's flat it doesn't work there's there's something just not gelling mm. and then you've got to go back and kind of start again and say okay well what about if i try this combination and it's not always your best and your favorite that works and that's fine because what you get from letting go of your own perception is you get the best thing for the story and you get the best people for the job. So you might have a personal opinion that you are the best person for this part. And unquestionably, you, you are the best. And then you put them with somebody else and they're not. And you've proven yourself to be inaccurate with your own judgment. And, um, and that's fine. You know, it's, it's, it's a human experience. It's not infallible. Mm. Uh, but once you start getting people together, you can see the chemistry between them, and then the thing starts to take shape. Well, uh, there is a question online as well. Do you get them face to face or not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I, I get both actors in the room, I give them the scene, and I film it, and I direct them as well. So uh, what, what about what about uh, self tapes in general? Like, do you think it's useful? Yes, absolutely. So don't you think that they need some direction for it, or so? So would no, no, because you you do start off with a um, a preconceived idea of the kind of person, whether it's a physical thing or whether it's a tone thing or whether it's the way they speak or the way they present themselves. You you start off with a, a kind of a germ, um, and also you know if people can't do a self tape, that comes across as professional and easy for them and they kind of know what they're doing and they're relaxed what are they going to be like on set if they can't do that in the privacy of their own home and then email that to you and it's you know it's mm -hmm. it's good it's a it's a good self-tape under the pressure of having an hour to do something or 10 minutes to do something with 50 people standing around waiting for you to to do that and you're shouting action if mm. If they can't do it at home, they're not going to be able to do it so, under that. So from, from self-tapes, going straight to directing now, when casting and experienced actors, test how they listen to your direction. Yeah. Is there anything you could kind of want to say about it? 
any good ex any good or bad experiences some people just don't listen um they have their own preconceived idea of what they're going to do um and it can be difficult to get them out of that and this they can be an experienced actor or an inexperienced actor in in my um experience the more experienced the actor um the less like they are likely they are to be kind of hemmed in to their own way of doing things and not listening to any anybody else but when you've got an inexperienced actor they're just doing the thing that they're confident with and they know that they can do and they don't deviate from that and it's very important to particularly when casting them um is to try and redirect them in a way that is not familiar to them mm. now whether it makes sense for someone to be reading a monologue or doing a a little speech that they've got prepared to do it as if it was a comedy act or a high wire act you know it might be a serious emotional piece that they're doing and you direct them or want to direct them in a way that is completely contrasting to the mood and the tone of the piece it doesn't matter can they hear you can they understand what it is that you want and can they do that and there's another question which is pretty good actually do you ever listen to actors suggestions of course yeah absolutely all the time all the time okay before you start storyboarding take the script and strip out the dialogue why because the dialogue unless you're quentin tarantino the dialogue is not the story you know visually what happens on the page or on the screen is your story now your story will should be able to stand and fall the best films if you were to mute them and just sit back and watch them you should still be able to enjoy them and get a sense and get a very strong sense about what it's about um you know we're we're no longer in the era of making talkies we're in the era of visual storytelling and i think it's a it's a really good idea that if you can strip out the dialogue and see your story and it still holds up then you can reintroduce that dialogue and there'll be a time and a point that you get to and you think actually we don't need any of this dialogue we don't need any of we don't need to say these things to distract people from seeing what that character is doing i think it's a, i think it's a very good tip yeah definitely and uh number where are we we are on so 79 aren't we so ensure the actors have something physical to do so you can't you really can't just shout action and everybody standing there because life doesn't work like that and it looks awkward on screen and it's uncomfortable everybody is always doing something now they can be they can be standing there and bursting to go to the loo or they can be standing there and they're bored or they can be standing there and they're waiting for somebody they're always doing something even if you're still you're never just standing there mm. so make sure that that is something that you introduce to your actors when you're when you're having to block those kind of scenes okay uh next one have a set of figures or cars or chess pieces or blah 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 whatever it is in your pocket to re-block the scene so 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 what do you mean by that yeah so um i had um, some little cluedo pieces i had four or five of those cluedo pieces so um if i needed to re-block something I could have the DP standing next to me. I could have the script supervisor, the first AD, maybe the actor, maybe one of the the uh, lighting gaffers, and I could put these little pieces down um, on the ground and say, "Okay, so this is Tim, this is Lena, this is Vic, and this is Alf, and they're all going to be from here, and then he's going to move across there while she moves that way." And you can re-block this something, and everybody quickly sees an overview of what it is you're trying to do. Um, it's a very, very quick way of being able to change things, um, particularly if you've got a fluid environment where you know you're shooting on a lower budget, you don't have time, you can't block off the areas that you thought maybe you could uh, when you were doing your initial recce. Um, having these little pieces, they can be anything. They can be marbles, they can be chess pieces. It's just a handful of objects that you can use to kind of move things around the ground and everybody suddenly, within 10 seconds, will understand what it is you're trying to do. Okay, number 89. 
your film is only as good as the actors you cast. Uh, or, or, or script. What about script? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay, well, okay, we passed the script now. We passed the script. We are past, we are past the script. You, you really have to get the best actors that you can afford. Um, you know, it's they they make things come alive. They can turn um, a poor scene into something better. Um, and they are worth their weight in gold. They will lift anything. A good actor can lift anything. It still might not be great, but it's going to be better than it, you know, it started with. So um, you know, always look for the very, very best actors you can get. Uh, what about uh, the next point about music licensing? You're saying licensing music is really expensive. And there is one rule you're kind of mentioning here. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so um, when it comes to um, you're in post-production, you're in edit, and um, you've got this song that you think, oh, that would be really good if we can have that song there. Um, and then you go and find out how much um, you've got to pay everybody um, to include that sa song. And you think, well, maybe I can get something else uh, that's cheaper. Um, or maybe you can have a composer do something. Um, and then you... you you very quickly learn that the positioning of the song in your film can actually determine how much you have to pay for it. So I wanted a song and I was quoted, I think it was um, £5,000 for this particular song that I wanted to include in the film. Um, and then when I told them that I wanted to use it as the opening title sequence, so as the words were coming up, the titles there, this song was playing, the price doubles. And if I'd wanted to use it as the end credits, so as everybody's name goes up, the price doubles. And that's just a premium you have to pay. And yes, you can negotiate, but you're still going to be paying twice the price to use mm -hmm. composed music uh, in either your opening titles or your end credits. So it's worth thinking about what you want to accompany those kind of spaces in your film. That's not going to cost you your budget. Never use a green screen app or green background on a mobile phone. That's that's interesting as well because that's something people are trying to do usually. Yeah, so you know, you 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 you've got your actor. Um, they get a phone call. It's a phone call from home. You do an insert shot. They pick up the phone. They put it and they have their little conversation. And you know, that's the end of your your little phone thing. Now, if a lot of people download the green app, and I made this mistake once, download the green app. So it's it's all green screen on the phone. Um, and so you can replace it basically. Yeah, it's, it's easier to replace in post production. And then they hold it up to their face. And you've got the green light reflecting on the that character. Makes... And suddenly that VFX job takes five times longer. It's not just a case of replacing the screen. It's also a case of changing the skin tone back to something normal. You're far rather not using anything on the phone at all. And it's just switched off. It's a nice square shape or a rectangle shape. It's actually very, very easy with today's tools to VFX that out. You're getting no glow or glare back from that. Um, so forget about the little green screen apps for mobile phones. Okay, yeah, that's a that's a good tip. That's a very good tip because uh, uh, those green screen apps are used constantly everywhere now. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, uh, there is a question about resolution and about uh, so. Uh, have you shot your film in four K? No, no, we didn't. So uh, did you use? Uh, did you did you shoot four uh, K for your green screen shots? No. No, we shot everything 2.8 because we um, we went anamorphic. So we used uh, Panavision anamorphic lenses and decided that it looked better at 2.8K. And actually, we didn't we didn't expect that um, we would get a, a, a kind of a 4K screening out of the film. Anyway, you know, it was never going to be a Netflix original, which they they now only want 4K. Um, and for cinema, 2.8 is, is perfectly fine. Okay, next one, 84. Hire the best DOP you can afford and then trust them. Do I need to even say anything about this? Pro you know, probably not. You are just, you are giving over um, the responsibility and the holder of the image to this person. 
Um, you choose the very best person that you can work with, collaborate with, and who has great skill and great talent, and then let them do their job. Let them do their job. Yeah. When actors take a risk, be there to catch them and take full responsibility if they fail. So often, often, sometimes, you might have an actor try something. Just try try doing it in a particular way. And it might not work. Um, and it might fall flat in the performance or in the way that you've either allowed them or directed them to do that. As a director, it's your responsibility to absorb that failure for yourself and take that on board and to say, that's my fault, that's not what I thought I was telling you to do, or that's not the way I saw it. Um, and be that cushion there for the actors so they don't think that they failed in trying to do something. Um, every time an actor stands in front of camera, they're reaching out for something. They are they are exposing themselves and reaching out for something. And as a director, it's your job to to be there for them and to absorb any failure that happens in front of camera as your fault. You haven't communicated properly, or you haven't told them exactly what it is that you want to do, you want the, them to do, um, or you know the lines are awful and how dare you give them those kind of lines to say. Take responsibility. It costs you nothing and it saves the actor a lot of humility on set because every time you shout action, they are exposing themselves for you. And if they feel comfortable in that environment, they will stretch themselves further. And as they stretch themselves further, they will fail more as well. And that's just it's just part of the process. So be there for them. Good one, good one. There's a little downside to casting a comedy actor in a straight role, but plenty of upside. So what do you mean by that? Yeah, so uh, normally if you've got if you've got a straight role and you you get casting suggestions coming to you and somebody might have a list of you know um, credits as a comedy actor and you think, well, are they really going to be able to do serious? Are they really going to be able to be that kind of rock? you'll find more than more than nine times out of ten that someone with great comic timing and a background in comedy can be the perfect straight person. Um, I think if if you've seen Ozark um, and you see Jason Bateman, for instance, in the, in the lead in Ozark, he's fantastic in that. Now, Jason's a, a primarily a comic actor. He's got great comic timing. But what he brings to that role, because he knows of the nuance of comedy, um, allows it to, to breathe and have a much greater depth. And if you just got a straight, serious, um, you know, someone who doesn't or is not really known for doing comedy, if you just put them in that role, you, you wouldn't have got half of the, the things um, that kind of come out of, of roles like that. And certainly in, in, in my experience, a comedy actor can often bring much more to the table than a straight serious actor. Mm. And it's great to hear actually, that's a, that's a good tip because people get typecasted and all that kind of stuff is happening all the time and and yeah. Okay, number 87. Storyboard your VFX and mark up your shots in Photoshop for VFX artist. Yeah, so um, again, this was because we I was working so closely with our VFX artist. Um, I was able to take shots or, um, you know, I was able to take a still yeah. from the shot, um, and then put that into Photoshop and then hand draw where exactly I wanted the VFX to be. So probably that saved some time and money as well, didn't it? It did. There, there wasn't a lot of back and forward, um, which there often is, you know, I've worked on high budget corporate shoots and stuff where, you know you're paying 25 grand for a particular shot to be made in VFX. And there's a lot of back and forward that goes on between that. Um, but we didn't have that. So I had to take on a lot of that responsibility. Um, so I found by drawing something in Photoshop, sending that to the storyboard artist who'd make a little previs out of it and then animate that previs, you get to the point succinctly, quickly, cheaply, efficiently, and you, you get a much better experience out of the whole thing. Um, so you can shortcut that process yourself. 
And uh, uh, the next one is about efficiency as well, I guess. Every location has at least one sweet spot to shoot from. So again, this comes back to those apps that I was talking about, um, Sunseeker in particular. Um, so you can see where the light is going to be at a particular time of day. Um, and, you know, every location, no matter where it is, there'll be, there'll be a really nice place for you to put the camera um, and get the best out of that location. Even if it's a brick wall on a street, there'll be a particular time of day um, or an angle that makes that um, either shine or it makes it the grimiest wall possible um and when you're wrecking it's down to you to find that space and, so, so uh, don't give up basically be creative and kind of yeah. open your eyes and and you'll Absolutely. and you'll find it okay uh, make sure you tell the story rather than explain it so i think this this is something that you do at script stage as well as something you do at storyboard stage and it's by the time you get on set you've probably already kind of iron these little moments out. Um, but there's a lot to be said um, for, for stripping back the dialogue and letting the story develop and not allowing your character to tell people what it is that's happening. Um, so it's that kind of exposition side of things. Um, let your story unfold. And if, you're, if you find that you're not always providing all of the answers all of the time, that's fine. Audiences love to work things out. They love to be thinking, but hang on, isn't isn't the fact that he's over there, isn't that going to change things when he gets to there? You know, all of those kind of conversations that an audience have as they're watching is really good. It, it, it grabs them. It makes them more engaged in your story. Um, don't feel the need to explain everything. And oh, the reason we've done that is because such and such can't be wherever so, he so said it. Basically, people, yeah, you don't have to kind of spoon fed like, you know, every spoon, single please. moment of a. And I think when, when we were doing this kids' film, I, I always wanted to not patronize these kids. You know, the, the film is made probably for eight to 11 year olds. That's the sweet spot for it. Um, now, you know, I've been a parent. I've I've experienced um, a child going through that process. Children always want to be more grown up than they are. Um, so never talk down to them. Always talk up to them and let them find you. Let them come up to your level. Um, don't patronize them and they'll respond really well. Mm. Shooting coverage should be your last resort. Yeah, I hate coverage, you know. So when I talk about coverage, I talk about, here's your wide shot, so that's your establishing shot, and then you've got your character here, so we'll go... Well, and that's we'll... television, isn't it? Yeah, we'll do a medium shot here, and then we've got a medium shot, and then we'll cut in for a little close-up on their reaction. You know, that is your last resort. And as you say, it's television. That is your absolute last resort. If You know, if you're storyboarding that from the outset, then you need to up your game and think again because it's not going to cut it anymore. It doesn't work. It's really dull. It's very, very boring. And there's a thousand other filmmakers out there who should be replacing you right now because you don't deserve to be there. Okay. Right, so. <laughs> Harsh. Yeah, but fair. Raise your game. Uh, use the weather. Don't fight it. Yeah, so, you know, it's, it's raining on your sunny day. Mm. Um, comment on it. Have your character mention it um have a an extra you know um walk by with an umbrella or something you know do something to just involve it and don't try and ignore it um particularly in the uk if you're shooting outside and again you're on a low budget it's inevitable you know the weather changes here sometimes two three times a day um you've got to acknowledge it and move on don't try and fight it because you won't win and uh, my movie, what about my movie? It's fine to say my movie yeah. when talking I, about the movie. I, I've come across a lot of people who, who challenge others when, when they say... Our movie. Yeah, or they say, oh, my movie that I just made. You know, my, and I completely disagree with challenging people uh, about their possession of it. Everybody gets to say my movie from... You know, anybody, anybody that showed up and put in an hour or more's work or a day's work on that film gets to say, my movie, this is my movie. It's not mine. It's not mine exclusively. It's also the producer's movie. It's also the actor's movie. It's anybody, 
anybody who has put time and effort into that gets to say my movie let go you know it's not necessarily <laughs> our movie there's a time where you might want to refer to it as our movie you know there's four or five of you and say well our movie but don't get possessive about it everybody gets to say it's my movie reshoots are not a sign of failure yeah just just listen to fincher on any of his director commentaries social network for instance and he talks about the reshoots of the reshoots that he had to do um you know don't beat yourself up about it if you've got to go and reshoot something because it didn't work out you're in good company that's that's good to know <laughs> 94 always tape your castings yeah so it's it's really useful to um to be able to go back and reflect uh, before you finally make that decision um, to see what someone looks like on screen, what happened in the room, you might come away with a slightly different feeling to what actually was captured on screen. Um, and if you've got that, you can also share that and share those thoughts with maybe somebody else um, who you're using as a sounding board, perhaps. Um, so it's I, t in today's day and age, it's vital, you know, mm -hmm. tape all your castings. 95. If you see that an actor is not quite there in the moment and is struggling between takes, go to the toilet. Yeah, you have remarkable power as a director because when you leave set, everything stops. Nothing happens. It's amazing. It, it's, it's like a tableau happens. You leave set and you come back and everybody's still in the same position. They, they just kind of almost headless. And, you know, what happened? The director's gone. We can't do anything. Um, so... You, you can use that power to your advantage. Um, I had a situation um, during uh, shooting where one of our actors was struggling with the script um, and we were trying to get through quite a lot of material in a very short space of time. Um, so it was neither their fault nor our fault. It was just, that was the way it was. Um, so rather than say, oh, do you need five minutes to go and learn that paragraph, um, I just went to Leo. Hmm. I just said, okay, I'm leaving set. Um, I'm going to Leo. And that gave the actor five, 10 minutes without drawing attention to the fact that they were struggling. Um, five, 10 minutes to go through it, sit there, work on it, and get it right. And that's a very useful tip as well, I have to say. Very yeah. useful. Okay, protect the actor's eyeliner. That's what you mean here, yeah? Yeah, not eyeliner. There's a typo. There, so. <laughs> yeah, that's that's makeup's job to protect. The um, as a director, everybody will be familiar about rant that Christian Bale had several years ago on. Set. Okay, how do you protect the eyeline? <laughs> well, Tell me. So, when, if when you're not protecting eyeliner, then no, when when an actor's on set and they may or may not have the other person they're talking to in front of them. If you're shooting here, it might be a single. You might not have the other actor that they're talking to, but they are looking beyond the camera and saying their piece of dialogue. Make sure that wherever they're looking off set, it's clear. There's nobody in their way. There's nobody moving things back and forward. There is nothing except emptiness of your location where they are looking. And as a director, and particularly as first ADs, you can help uh, assist that. Um, but just make sure that that space that they're looking into um, is empty. You know, uh, it, there's no crew, nothing. Christian Bale ranted about this um, quite a few years ago now, and I think there was a recording made and it went around on the internet and everybody kind of um, started castigating Christian about it and saying, oh, he, you know, he wasn't entitled to have that kind of rant. He was. He was right. He may not have went about it in the right way, but actually when that actor's looking off camera into an imaginary space and seeing something that is not there, whether it's another character or something else, as a director, you need to make sure that that space is good and as calm and as peaceful as it can be for the actor. Because, you know, we're all just pretending. It's all just a case of let's pretend. Let's make it as easy as possible for everybody to do their job. Okay, next one I, I really like as well. No mobile phones on set. Yeah, so as soon as somebody picks up a mobile phone, they're no longer in your world. They're no longer on set. 
if people need to communicate on set, we have walkie-talkies, and that's what they're there for. A mobile phone will take you out of the, the family that you've created, and you'll be part of another family or um, you know, another group of people that you're then involved with. Even if you're, you're, you're talking to the next location or you're talking to somebody else, you leave set. No mobile phones on set whatsoever amongst the crew, the cast, you have a strict no mobile phone policy. Yeah, and and it's, it's good because because otherwise it's very very difficult now to deal with it. Yeah, of course, and you know, people will then start texting, and you just don't want that. You you want everybody in your world. Okay, so the next one is always be the f uh, always be there for the actors. Yeah, so. The actor department is your job. You're head of the actor department as director. Um, that's your gang. So the DP is head of the lighting and camera department. So you don't need to get involved there. Uh, makeup is head of the makeup and um, uh, their department and um, art department. They, they look after themselves. You don't need to interfere in any of those departments. You talk to the heads of departments, obviously, but your department are the actors. So you are there for them. You are the conduit between what's going on on set and what you want them to do. So when they arrive, um, when they leave, when they're on set, they are your responsibility. Okay, and uh, number, we're almost done actually. Wow, this is crazy. We, we've done it pretty fast this time. Uh, so 99, have a small bag with wet gear, shoes, boots, uh, and so on and on. So it's always worth just packing a little wet bag um, of wet gear, um, well, dry gear for wet weather, um, and just stick it in the camera truck and forget about it until the time you need it. Because there will be a shower at some point in the UK and you will get drenched. And that might be great at five o'clock and you've only got another 20 minutes to go. So you can stand there in your wet clothes or sit down in your wet clothes, wherever. But if that happens and it's the first setup of the day, then you're stuffed really. So if you've got a little bag, you've put it in the camera truck at the beginning of the shoot, it will still be there throughout the entire shoot. And you know that you can go and get some, some dry gear from there. Um, it's just a little backup. And 100, we're there says yeah <laughs> stay hydrated <laughs> stay hydrated everything changes when you're hydrated you're less tense you're less angsty um you know just keep drinking the water okay uh, oh that's that's it we're done with 100 uh, tips yeah that's that's a lot it's basically in total roughly three and a half hours of useful information for young directors Thank you very much, James. You're very welcome. It, it was great. Yeah. I really enjoyed it. And uh, honestly, if I would see something like this, if I would see this list a few years back, I would be very happy. I've seen it now, and it makes me happy even today. So thank you very much. I'm sure it's going to be very helpful to, uh, to all the filmmakers around the universe. <laughs> and uh, yeah, hope to see you again. And if you have any new projects you want to talk about, yeah, just just let us know, and uh, and we we're gonna go and see your movie in the cinema. Good. Take any uh, any children you know, borrow some children mm -hmm. to, to to get yourself in. Yeah, I, I have my own now actually, so maybe soon I'll be able to show you a movie. <laughs> Brilliant. So, all right guys uh, thank you for watching and it was a it was a long day it was a long and 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 fun day uh we managed to talk about screenwriting we managed to talk about directing we covered a lot and i'm so glad uh and i'm so happy to be able to put all this information uh onto our website and guys you can access it completely free of charge anytime you like at independentfilmproductions.co.uk thank you and bye-bye.